Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Pasco School District Board of Directors study session. This afternoon we'll be studying the bond process and we have Mr. Jim McNeil here to lead us through, as he has right there, an overview of, uh, of our bond process. Good afternoon. I just want to take a minute to introduce Jim. Um, he's the district's bond attorney, and we were looking back for a number of years, um, 13 as a matter of fact, and his firm has been working with PASCO since 1977, at least almost 40 years at Foster Pepper. Um, you see Jim here usually when you're talking about an election and you're talking about finance. Most recently you saw him in connection with the February levy amount. There's a lot of legal obligations there. And today he's going to talk a little bit about bonds. As the president has said, his, his role is key as part of the bond team. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. And then also talk about the basic characteristics of the bond and then a bond timeline that will help you kind of orient, you know, going forward where the different steps need to take place. And with that, I'll get out of the way and let Jim go. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I, this afternoon, I uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to go through this analysis and uh, to discuss an overview of the legal requirements for the issuance of bonds. And Howard is right. We, uh, in addition to serving as bond counsel, we do draft uh, many of the documents related to such things as, the, as if you were to engage in a change of use or uh, alter some of those expenditures related to either state match or bond proceeds. Uh, and also drafting your maintenance and operation levies uh, over the last several years. So with that, I'd just like to provide a, a quick overview of, of what our role is as bond counsel. If, if you at any time have any questions during my presentation, please stop me and, and we'll entertain those questions. Um, bond counsel is generally a term that um, originated really back at the turn of the century. Uh, in After several defaults in New York, uh, a lot of uh, municipalities were trying to find uh, lawyers who would uh, opine upon the validity of their bonds and uh, they recognized that they needed to go outside of their local council and they found uh, these quote nationally recognized bond lawyers who could opine to the validity of their bonds and so uh, that's how uh, the term uh, originated and uh, we are a nationally recognized bond counsel firm uh, in the state uh, and, and throughout the nation, we're ranked usually in the top 10 of all bond council firms in the nation representing uh, municipalities and the issuance of taxes and bonds. Our primary role, uh, which is it's symbiotic in the sense that we are with, um, symbiotic in our relationship with the underwriters, because generally what we do is we render an illegal opinion that your bonds are valid and that interest on those bonds is tax exempt. With that legal opinion then, the underwriter can then sell the bonds in the market. Uh, so we've kind of created this unique uh, uh, relationship, if you will, that, that they're dependent upon our, our legal opinion. And of course, with that, uh, we strive uh, as part of our duties to make sure that we advise the district relating to all state laws and federal tax laws. Remember, uh, the issuance of municipal bonds uh, across several types of, of legal requirements. Uh, federal securities law, thus the, the SEC likes to be involved because you're issuing municipal securities. Uh, also federal tax law because your bonds are, the interest on those bonds is tax exempt, so the IRS wants to be involved. And then state law because you're a municipal corporation in the state of Washington. So we would advise the district relating to all those uh, types of laws uh, for the issuance of bonds. We prepare all the authorizing documents, whether that's the election resolution, which we'll talk about further, uh, together with the bond sale resolutions and other types of documents necessary to, to close the transaction, if you will, and, and make sure you can receive your, your dollars. We also review all the disclosure, the prospectus that is used uh, uh, to sell the bonds that the underwriter prepares. Uh, we will review that to make sure it's consistent with state and federal uh, securities laws as well. And we also uh, oversee the delivery of the bonds to, to DTC, the depository trust company that holds those bonds. Um, and so we go through all the, the, the closing process to make sure that uh, all the documents are signed and ready uh, for closing itself. And then we will, as I, as I noted earlier, advise on other finance-related matters, levies and the expenditure of funds and, and, and audits to the extent that you encounter those. 
So without going into too much detail, uh, I just wanted to provide an overview of UTGO bonds. UTGO bonds are known as unlimited tax general obligation bonds because you have the unlimited taxing power to repay these bonds. Generally, you will uh, communicate a specific uh, tax rate to your voters, but under state law, when your voters authorize the um, issuance of the bonds and the repayment of the bonds, you are authorized to repay these bonds with excess taxes, i.e. unlimited as to rate or amount. Unlike your m and levy, where you're supposed to identify an amount for collection that then translates into an estimated levy rate, a bond, um, you have a maximum principal amount that you are authorized to issue, and then you repay those bonds uh, with, unlimited tax, uh, with your unlimited taxing power. You're also pledging your full faith and credit uh, as well, and also the state of Washington guarantees uh, your bonds as kind of a third layer of security. So going through this table, uh, you can see that the use of uh, bond proceeds may only be used for capital purposes, construction, uh, modernization of school facilities. Our Constitution uh, prohibits a replacement of equipment, uh, which is somewhat of a, a unique uh, uh, restriction. Uh, generally, uh, if you have a piece of equipment that you're replacing that serves a new or better purpose or has a longer useful life that's not considered a replacement. Uh, and so, uh, but generally when you're building schools or, or building additions or renovating schools, you're not going to encounter, quote, the replacement of equipment. So um, then we go into the re approval requirements. Uh, generally, you will uh, have the board, school board adopt an election resolution at an open public meeting that requests the auditor to conduct an election to submit a ballot measure to the voters uh, authorizing the issuance of the bonds. Requires 60% voter approval. There are four election dates. That's changed over the years. Uh, this is kind of in our current uh, formula. The election dates used to be uh, considerably more. I think at one point we had approximately six to eight elections, depending on if you failed, you could run at another time that you might deem necessary. So over the years, um, we've seen election dates come and go, and, and of course the legislature always uh, likes to play around with those election dates, depending on what type of information and uh, pressure they might receive from the, the county auditors. The four election dates that we have now really are a result of um, some horse trading between the legislature and the county auditors related to the original 50 percent uh, simple majority that was approved back in 2008 by the state voters. So right now uh, the auditors really had a lot to do with why there's only four elections they wanted to control uh, and for good reason the amount of work and the deadlines and, and all and how much time consuming uh, the con conducting election really is. Unlike your levy, the bonds require a 40% uh, turnout of the last general state election, which will be very interesting this year. Uh, so you, all your elections, or all your bond elections for 2017 will be based on 40% of your last, of the last state general election turnout. So in other words, when you look at your validation requirements for 2017, should you decide to run in, in February, it will be compared against 40% of the turnout in 2016 presidential election. So it could be very high. We, we don't know that. There's, there's any speculation out there thinking that uh, it could be high, it could be low, depending on whether people want to vote or not. So um, we have several districts um, on the November ballot because they were concerned that they wanted to, to use last year's validation numbers instead of this year's. So uh, I'm not sure that it's really been in much of an issue in the last probably 10 years since we have the vote by mail uh, process instead of uh, polling place elections. So that has really changed the dynamics of, of whether val validation is even, even a concern. So. Um, also then, once the voters approve the, the measure, the school board must adopt what we call a delegation resolution. That resolution authorizes the um, issuance and sale and delivery of the bonds and delegates the authority uh, to the superintendent to approve the final terms and conditions of the sale of those bonds. We've, we've used that process, that delegation uh, resolution over the last several refunding bonds uh, that the district has issued. Maximum term length of the bonds generally doesn't exceed the useful life of what you're financing. 
typically is 20 to 25 years. The statute actually allows 40 years, uh, but that is, uh, we rarely see a 40-year bond unless you're talking about a bond with the USDA or some type of sewer or utility type uh, improvement. Uh, schools, it's usually somewhere between 20 and 25. We have seen shorter ones of, of 15. I think um, Pasco's has traditionally been around 20 years. So. And we usually set that as the outside at the outside limit, so the bonds must mature within 20 years. So you might have a maturity depending on when you issue bonds. If you issue bonds in June, you might your maximum maturity might be 19 and a half years. But we set it at the outset of, of 20 just to give you the flexibility. Um, and some districts like to go 21, 22 years uh, in case the market changes, and that enables you to have a few more years within which to amortize uh, the bond issue. A few considerations, we talked about the, the repayment of, of the bonds with unlimited taxing power and the, the full faith and credit and the state of Washington uh, guarantee. By the way, your, all of your bonds, I think at this point, I think all the bonds that you've issued uh, in the last several years have the state guarantee with it anyway. And the, and the state guarantee has really replaced bond insurance. It, the state guarantee uh, allows you to obtain the state's credit rating because the state of Washington is guaranteeing the repayment of your bonds should something happen to the district. So uh, it, it has been a great mechanism for lowering your borrowing costs. If you can obtain the state's credit rating, it certainly helps uh, in the market. Um, and a couple of other considerations, uh, the total debt, uh, your total debt must not exceed 5% of your assessed value. Uh, so we took a look at your 5% uh, of that number, we subtract out your outstanding debt and that gives us what your, um, your remaining or unused debt capacity is related to bonds. One other uh, consideration, or at least it, I guess it's a, it's a comparison if you contrast bonds between an M&O levy. Bonds really are for capital expenditures. Our Constitution indicates that you have to use uh, bond proceeds for capital expenditures. Uh, and in fact, there's court cases that uh, construe that bonds may not be used for any type of, quote, maintenance-related expenditures. And thus, a maintenance operation levy would pay for educational programs, student services, and operations not funded by the state of Washington. And that, that language actually comes directly from your last uh, maintenance and operation levy, uh, specifically your funding educational program, student services and operations not funded by the state. Any questions on that? I know that's a lot of- Did you say the 40% voter turnout, that, that's 2017 is when that's starting? Uh, it will be, f it's, it's in place now. And so, but you will use, uh, your turnout has to be 40% of the voters that turned out in November 8th of 2016. So you'll go back and look. In fact, the auditor should be able to give uh, the district that number as far as what your validation number is that you have to hit. Have we looked at um, percentages that we get after a presidential election turning out for our next levy? I have that information. Okay. You think it'll be an issue or? Is it close, or are we way over 40% in Pasco here? Because Mr. McNeil said, I think since the mailing part is just incredibly recent, people haven't had any of the trouble with that. Right. So it's changed the whole ballgame in the past. I'm not going to get over what I think right. it's going to be. Well, and particularly with February elections, it would be very difficult to, if you have a weather issue that comes up, sometimes you, you wouldn't be able to get people to, to come out for your, your elections, and so therefore your, your validation requirements would be less. So that has really has minimized over the years with the use of the all-mail ballots. Um, and I don't even think there's been, I'm not aware of one in the last 10 years maybe that has failed uh, to validate uh, from, from bond. Your levies don't have a validation requirement. That went out in 2008 when the, when the voters approved uh, the simple majority. So going to that first step in the process that um, I highlighted uh, in the last slide, the first step is that the board must adopt uh, a, what we call an election resolution as far as the sequence of events goes. The board determines the capital improvements, the amount of the bonds to be issued, and the election date. Um, and then uh, during that process, when the district is doing that, we'll be in communication to make sure there's no issues as far as use of the proceeds and to make sure that everything that you want to do is consistent with both state and federal, federal law. 
Um, we'll end up drafting that election resolution just like we do the maintenance and operation levies. Uh, the basic elements of that resolution include uh, the purpose of the bonds and for state match. State law does require that you identify what your purposes will be for the state match. Um, generally, we, we, we define all of the projects that you want to utilize your bond proceeds for as the projects. And then in our in a, a provision in the resolution, we identify that you can use the state match to complete all of the projects. And then if you've got any state match left over, uh, then you could hold a public hearing to decide what type of projects you want to use that extra money for should you have money left over. And it's pretty common. We see a lot of districts throughout the state that have excess state match, and then we take them through the public hearing process, and they're able to use that for other capital purposes. Um, the resolution also would request that the auditor conduct a special election uh, at one of the statutory election dates. Um, we must state the maximum principal amount and maturity of the bonds. It will, the resolution will also have a form of the ballot title, and it will also contain a request that notice of that ballot be given to the district to make sure that the auditor and prosecutor attorney don't make any specific changes in that ballot language. Certainly, the prosecutor has that discretion. They are the final authority on uh, what the ballot title should look like, and, and they're the ones that actually approve that ballot title. But generally, they'll give deference uh, to the district in this regard, and the board specifically. Um, as I said, that the actual ballot title that the voters will see will be in the election resolution just like it is in, in the m and levy resolution. And then, among other things, there will also be a, a request to participate in the state guarantee program. We include that as part of uh, the election resolution. And then the next sequence of events, uh, the board adopts the election resolution. And then going into, I wanted to show, I wanted you to see this. This is from the, the bond ballot proposition that was approved by the voters in 2013. And I think this kind of goes through a couple of things. One is it, it shows the overall theme, uh, which is in the first sentence. And I've highlighted that uh, there's a 10 word limit and a 75 word limit. And we actually do count those words because we don't want uh, to provide anyone an opportunity to challenge the validity of your bond issue. And so we try to strive to be very uh, careful and, uh, and strategic in how we're counting those words. And so after the word concerning, you have a 10-word limit, uh, starting with A, proposition of finance, construction, improvement of school facilities. You can see that's kind of a, the theme of the, of the ballot measure itself, and, and, a, and it's supposed to be a summary of, of, of the ballot itself. Uh, in recent years, we have also used such words as to relieve overcrowding and improve safety, because some of those are overarching uh, themes that you're seeing with districts throughout uh, the state at this, at this level. Um, and then the proposition, uh, the next sentence, which is really the, the essence of the proposition, uh, state law requires that you have to identify the, the purpose of the bonds, the maximum principal amount, maximum term, um, that taxes will be levied to repay those bonds. Um, and so this resolution hits all those, those points. You can see uh, the description of would authorize the district to construct three elementary schools, improve Stevens Middle and Pasco High Schools, um, relocate New Horizons, provide additional classrooms district-wide, uh, make health, safety, and infrastructure improvements, improve traffic flow, design future school construction, and or renovation and acquire land. Then you get into the next um, few sentences, which are to issue no more than 400 46,864,000 of general obligation bonds maturing within 20 years and levy annual excess property taxes to repay those bonds as provided in resolution number 850. The last tagline as provided in the resolution is important because our Supreme Court has said that when voters approve this ballot measure uh, and there's a reference to the resolution that requests the ballot measure be submitted to the voters, that the voters are actually voting on the entire resolution, which is good because there's a lot of information that we have contained within the text of the resolution. And so the Supreme Court says uh, voters are not only voting on this proposition, but they're voting on the entire election resolution. Any questions on that? I got a question. So <clears throat> this resolution then is what we as the board adopt? Correct. And it gets rolled into this. Well, by, yes. By, I don't know what the right word is, but I mean, in essence, it's with those, uh, that last sentence there, right. it gets, they're voting on what we approved. So it's really bigger than, the, than this. It, it, it's exactly right. Because again, state law has limits on how much you can say 
And right. so there's a lot of details. For instance, uh, one provision that we include in the resolution is the, the ability of the district to use bond proceeds to pay incidental costs of the project. Architecture, engineering, permitting, all those kinds of um, incidental costs, uh, site improvement, utilities. And we can't, well, there's no possible way to, sure. to include all those items in there. And so, so it's very important that we have that flexibility. And then there's other provisions in the resolution that talk about the board's discretion to determine how you're going to apply those dollars. Which projects are you going to do first? I mean, all those things are within the board's discretion and are contained in the text of that resolution. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's not, I mean, they would have to go look that up somewhere else if they really wanted to get down into the, it's not, certainly not included on the ballot. And it's not, and, and generally, I think the district has, has, has a, usually kept a copy on, or at least on the website, there'll be a, a reference to, to the actual text of the resolution. Some, That's good. Okay. If, if you were going to be doing a local voters pamphlet, which you're not, I don't believe, uh, well, I take that back. You, you will be doing a local voters, yeah, the county has now. Uh, made that uh, a requirement. So you will be doing a local voters pamphlet specifically. But some counties, uh, Franklin County doesn't do this. Some counties actually publish the entire resolution, like King County does that, and Pierce County will do that too, the entire resolution uh, in their in the local voters pamphlet. So. Yeah, it may not be a bad idea, but I'm not sure how much influence we have on that, as long as we keep it somewhere where people can access it so we're not being blamed. That right. And, and that I think that is the important uh, very good point and, and very important that your constituents can, can access that resolution um, on, on the district's website. It's just important to transparency and, and being straightforward and honest. So that's Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. And as I said, there, the, there's so much more to it than just, I mean, again, we, what we try to do is to provide a very brief overview of the projects. And so there is more detail. When we say for instance, um, in this you'll see we, uh, the description of make health, safety, and infrastructure improvements. That description had about a full paragraph of various improvements that were listed, again, because there's no way of, of going into that level of detail in the ballot title. But we can certainly reference that in the ballot so the voters are triggered. I wonder what they're doing. And so that way they can then reference back uh, to the district publications, uh, fact sheets, or the resolution should they should they want to to know more? After the board adopts the election resolution, is filed with the Franklin County Auditor by a specific date. Uh, for instance, uh, December sixteenth is the resolution filing deadline for the February election date. Um, once filed, the auditor assumes the jurisdiction to conduct the election. They do all the notices. They do everything they're supposed to do to make sure that that ballot measure goes before, um, before the voters appropriately. The prosecuting attorney will approve the ballot title, hopefully without changes. Uh, and then generally, we will see, uh, once the prosecuting attorney approves that, we will get an email from the county auditor's office saying, here's the, here's the ballot title as approved by the, by the prosecutor and the auditor. Do you have any comments? And at that point, then, we're able to look at it and make sure that it's, it's consistent with what the board has approved in the, resol in the bond election resolution. And then there, are, there is the uh, public, also the concern over making sure that you're compliant, in compliance with the public disclosure laws, as well as um, what's necessary for the local voters pamphlet. Generally, the county will require an explanatory statement that's usually prepared by, by me. Um, and then uh, the board must appoint pro and con committee members. All of that has to take place by the filing deadline, which I think, I'm fairly certain it's still going to be December 16th. They usually try to, to coincide with the, f the filing deadline for the resolution. So that will be on, on your plate as well for, for the meeting um, in December or late November, whichever, um, whenever you're going to have a meeting related, uh, at least prior to the filing deadline. And then um, after adoption, then the voters will hopefully approve uh, the ballot proposition. Then we get into a few more of the details related to the specifics about what happens in the sequence of events once the bonds are approved, the voters have approved the, the measure. Um, and this is very similar to the refunding bonds that, that we just completed uh, in, in this process. After voter approval, the district's underwriter, Piper Jaffer, will prepare a preliminary official statement, which is reviewed by all the district officials as well as bond council. Um, this is the prospectus. If you're in the private sector and see these, these, pers these large prospectuses, that's what uh, we will prepare to make sure that the bonds are sold in that fashion. Um, 
And then we'll also then prepare the bond sale documents, which would include the delegation resolution, um, and, which I briefly touched on, which authorizes the issuance of the bonds and then delegates authority to, uh, to the superintendent secretary uh, to accept P Piper Jaffray's offer to purchase the bonds. It has all sorts of parameters that, um, for instance, when Piper goes into the market to sell the bonds uh, on, on that sale date, there'll be uh, you know, a maximum interest rate, a maximum true interest cost for the bonds, a price parameter, uh, a redemption parameter. All those parameters have to be established on the day of pricing. Otherwise, we will not allow uh, Michelle to sign that bond purchase agreement because, again, we're, we're rendering a legal opinion that your bonds are valid. If, if, for instance, any of those parameters are not established and we uh, allow Michelle to sign that bond purchase agreement, obviously we're exposed uh, with our legal opinion on, on the validity of the bond. So we are very cautious to make sure that all those parameters are established. In fact, Michelle will sign a certificate uh, that identifies that we've hit all these uh, parameters that are identified in the resolution. And then after adoption of the bond uh, delegation resolution, uh, the board will, will um, typically prepare, um, right, so let me just back up a second because I want to make sure I didn't get ahead of myself here. So the preparation of the, so I wanted to highlight this because it, it can be a little confusing. The first item after voter approval, the district, the underwriter, Piper Jeffrey, will, will commence preparation of the official statement. They'll start gathering all the data. And then once that's done, then after, typically after adoption of the delegation resolution, within a few week period of time, then uh, Piper will uh, distribute that preliminary official statement to investors, usually about a week or so before pricing. Uh, and so that investors have a chance to, to review that uh, preliminary official statement. That same day, uh, Piper will make uh, an offer to the district via bond purchase agreement to purchase the bonds after review. Um, Michelle will sign and execute the BPA and then we'll start down the process for pr the preparation of all the closing documents necessary uh, for the transaction. Generally, closing will take place two or three weeks following the execution of the BPA. So a, a typical time frame, and I'll, I'll get into that after, after the last item five here. Um, and then at closing, bond proceeds are wired uh, to the county treasurer, and then bonds are delivered to uh, DTC, the Depository Trust Company, uh, which holds the bonds on behalf of the, the registers and owners. So here's, here's a, a sample timeline. And I just assumed a, a February election, um, but this generally would be similar for, for most of the elections except on a, on a primary or general election because the time frames are a little bit longer, the filing deadlines are a little longer. You can see uh, the board meeting today, uh, board adopts an election resolution if you assume October, November-ish. Uh, again, we identify the bond election filing resolution December 16th. The ballots are mailed on January 27th. The election takes place on February 14th. Then the, the board might adopt a delegation resolution March or April. The official statement is, dist is distributed uh, April, May. Piper would price the bonds April, May, and then you'd close in May, May or June. I mean, that's a, a, just a general time frame. You can see how, how, uh, how that process would work. It can, it can be longer or shorter depending on, on how urgent the need is to, to get dollars in place. I would also point out that one of the provisions we include in the, um, in the bond election resolution is a reimbursement provision, which enables the district to reimburse itself. If you if you wanted to start spending dollars um, after the election, you knew that the, the voters had approved the measure and you needed to start spending some of those dollars, you could do that as long as you have an, uh, a reimbursement resolution in place. We accomplished that, and that's a federal tax requirement. We accomplished that by including that provision in the election resolution. And then that way, what would happen is if you wanted to uh, use your bond, use your general fund monies for any of the projects earlier before the bonds are actually sold in May, you could start spending those dollars earlier. And then once the bonds are closed, you can reimburse your general fund for those expenditures. So that's uh, a very brief overview of uh, the bond election and uh, resolution process. Any questions at all related to this, this process? I've got some questions on pricing. So if we approve a bond for 46 million or whatever it is, 
And then it says there, Piper Jaffray prices these bonds. Right. What, what does that mean? Pricing is, um, and I apologize, it is a term of art in the, in, in the industry, and they will go into the market um, to sell your bonds. And, and what they're doing is they're going into the market and getting investors to offer prices for uh, the purchase of your bonds. They are the initial purchaser of the bonds. What they will do is they'll purchase those bonds at a, at a, at a and they'll, they'll go into and to the market and offer to buy all your bonds from you. And then they'll turn around and sell those bonds to investors after they've communicated and established a pricing model with those investors. So morning of closing, they're calling investors um, over the phone saying, you know, do you want to buy $5 million worth of Pasco bonds uh, maturing in 2020? And okay, thank you. And then once they get commitments from all those investors over the phone, which is still crazy because of all the documents we end up signing, they're doing this, you know, they're selling millions over the phone. Um, but then what they'll do is they'll come back after they've gotten enough orders, they'll come back and say, okay, we're comfortable that we've got enough orders to fill that we'll offer to buy all of your bonds. They'll buy the bonds with a bond purchase agreement, and then they'll turn around on closing date, then those investors get those bonds. So do we end up, I mean, if we pass a bond for 46 million, do we end up with 46 million? How, I, I'm, I'm not understanding that yes, part of it as you, my- you, is, you should, you should receive exactly uh, that amount that the voters have authorized. If you were to issue the entire amount, right. um, you could you would receive that entire forty six million into your account. So it's not affected by the pricing then. What? Well, this is a little tricky and a little beyond my uh, my uh, expertise in the sense that uh, I don't want to step on Trevor's toes necessarily. But generally, what they will do is it's affected in pricing because at least in the current market, we're in a climate right now where investors are willing to pay more for your bonds than they're worth, in the, or that they... Um, than the return on them is. Exactly, and, and the whole reason why is that investors want to pay more. They pay what we call an original issue premium as a hedge against interest rates going up. Right. And so we might end up only selling 43 million principal amount of the bonds and it, we may generate another three million in premium. Okay. That whole amount thing gets deposited into the capital projects fund, and now you've burned up all your authorization. So, even though you're really only issuing a principal amount of forty-three million, when you deposit that extra three million of premium into the capital projects fund, now we've used up that authorization. So, it, but but in essence, pricing doesn't affect the amount of money we get. In, I mean, no. No, Maybe you're correct. It, it does not. Just, yeah. it, it really all depends on what's happening in the market. The ultimate goal is that you get all of your dollars in your capital projects fund on closing. Now, I will say that um, at least in, in since probably the last 10 years, we've been in this uh, premium market, if you will. Before that, bonds were sold at, at a discount. And so instead of 46 million, you might only get 45 million because investors aren't willing to pay mm -hmm full face value for your bonds. And so that, that has, that's been a little challenging. And so in that kind of a market, then um, <clears throat> it, it creates a little bit of a different challenge. So. Right. Right. so the interest rates, are they determined over those phone calls? Yes. Okay. And if they get, to, this is, it's, it's really an interesting process um, and how they will price the bonds. They'll, they'll make those phone calls. And what they'll do is they'll, 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 their um, sellers will call their investors that they know, and they will, <clears throat> if they get interest rates too quickly, and all of a sudden they are oversubscribed, meaning that they've done too good of a job of pricing the bonds, too good of a job. In other words, the interest rate is too high. Then they'll go back and they'll reprice them. In the sense, they'll go back and say, hey, would you take that bond at Two to, at 2.1% instead of 2.5%. And so they'll go back because they'll realize and investors will, will respond that way. So they can go back and, and gauge what the market is like uh, related to setting those interest rates. So. Okay. Yeah, it's That's, a, that sounds like a, <clears throat> another reason to run the bond now rather than later because interest rates have been very fa favorable. It just doesn't seem like they'll stay that way forever. We. 
I think everyone has said, uh, probably every time that Trevor has been before the board in the last five years doing refundings and issuing, and issuing new, new money bonds, um, we've said, we, you know, it's a great time. Interest rates can't go any lower. Well, they've gone lower. And, uh, and they're still at all-time lows, at least in the last, I don't know, 35, 40 years. And so we still are in that climate where you just, I just can't imagine. So, but, but you're right. I mean, eventually they're going to go up. And the, the question is, is that it is a good time to be in the market to sell bonds. So. Okay, any other questions? All right. Felt like I was just drinking from a water hose. So <laughs> I think I got the gist of it, and I really appreciate the, the understanding that you brought. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And if a question comes up, uh, don't hesitate to call or um, have Howard give me a call. However, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that come up during during the, the process. So, all right, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeil, and uh, thank you, Mr. Roberts, also. I could say, too, you'll appreciate Jim more when you see the bond resolution. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy with all the IRS requirements <clears throat> and all. I did want to, while we're talking about uh, bonds here, just to and levies, actually, just to mention, I think, what is some good news. Um, about this time of year, I go check with Steve Marks, the county assessor, and say, what are you looking at for next year's assessed value for 2017? That we'll pay our bond and levy amounts for that following year. And of course, the assessed values we've talked about is the, kind of the tax base for the whole district. And generally, in the past, we've assumed 3%, just kind of a blanket. That's, that's been pretty close. Mr. Marks informed me that we're looking at 8.98% increase in the assessed value for 2017. Now, he's always a little hesitant. There's some caveats. There's some pieces he doesn't have yet from the state of Washington. Shouldn't affect it a lot, though, in, in my opinion, but he always puts that on there. So at any rate, just some highlights from that. He said we have over $60 million in new construction that came on last year. Existing residential, that assessed value was up an average of 3% and then 15% increase in commercial value, which is what we've been waiting for for a while. So, and he said this does not include the auto zone, which is to come online, you know, hopefully next year. So, at any rate, I just wanted to give you, give you that just to think about, I'm gonna work through the implications for our existing bonds and levies, and I will get back to you with that as soon as I have that information. Along those same lines, I think, uh if I understand it right, this DNR ground that's up there on Road 68 is coming up for auction, uh, I'm assuming, fairly soon. Yes, yeah, so I and saw that, that in the paper, right? That, will, uh, that should come on the tax rolls as well. Yes. Now, I don't know if there's other money that we lose because it goes out of, out of state control, but, but uh, that yeah. should help. Yeah, that should help, yeah. That and should be fairly valuable property, you would think. Yeah. And this gives us well, yeah, a few more counts, options, yeah. because if we want to keep that bond low, we might be able to add add some things that are really needed to that bond if, if necessary and still keep it at that 50 cent range. So that's, that's an option now. That's great. So, so I think maybe one of the things, you know, Jim, so if we go out with a 20-year bond, I mean, the, the, the length of the bond de affects the rate, right? So I think we need to be careful, and, and I know we're on public television here, but, but all of our bonds and even our levies, I think, we've projected high and have ended up coming in lower. And uh, so I, I, I don't want to get too high you know, project too high and then get, come in way low and then set this precedent that, gosh, these, our, our tax rates are low, so. Right. That's always the trick, though. What do you, what do, you do? Because you really don't want to come back with the other message come back. and say, Absolutely. we're going to have to charge you 10 cents more per thousand because so, we overshot. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're right, though. It behooves us to get as close as we can. That's why I talked to Mr. Marks, and that's happened every year since I've been here. And, he did tell me this time, he said, I'm going to throw the crystal ball away because it was <clears throat> off last year. Sure. A bit, and, but. I mean, that's nearly 9%. That's, yeah. that's huge. So next it's, year it'll be zero. But The new construction but. he mentioned was the highest increase in seven years. So yeah. that's, that's a good sign. What, what is our, 
What is our um, debt capacity right now? It's around 120 million. So yeah. we have that available to us. Right. Or now that's what our this, total what this will do, it will add, remember it's 5% of your assessed value. Right. So when that new dollars come on in 2017, we'll, we'll add some additional dollars to the capacity. So, so 117, and what was the bond we were talking about? 80 something? Yeah, it was 73.7, I think. Okay. Yeah, with the 10 million for the K3 grant match, yeah. Okay, I... Thanks, Howard. That's all I have. Love so. good news. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think this, you know, that information is uh, not surprising. Uh, certainly the, the amount is probably surprising, but it's interesting the reports that we get about how this is going to slow down. There's not going to, all these concerns earlier in the year that reports we get that there's not going to be home building and impact fees and all this. And and as much as you say, no, we, you know, we don't buy it. And and it's, and we're right, you know, it, the, the estimates in our community are not accurate. The models don't work, and, all, and I'm just going to say a reason why. And, and this isn't going to change anytime soon. So I don't. And this is anyone that drives down Sandifer can see this. That there's just there's four or five developments within one mile of each other, just all the way up. And the reason is is in our community there is a Mormon Temple in Richland, and that draws a huge number of members of that church to our community. And they are young families with lots of children and they preferentially move to Pasco. The houses are more affordable. These are young families, and none of the estimates gather that data, and that is why in Pasco, in West Pasco, there's a constant increase, and it's not gonna slow down anytime soon, as long as I'm on the school board. So um, the estimates from the state and national estimates don't take into account that they just can't capture that they don't see the dynamics in our community of things like that it doesn't fit into any model and so i i've continued to support a very aggressive facilities plan because there's just not going to be an end in sight and i i can't wait to pull the numbers from the estimates earlier this year the estimated this kind of gradual drop in some of our uh, levels of of students over the next two to 10 years, and they're just not gonna be accurate. I guarantee it, and I'd love to, I can't wait to go back and look in two years and three years and four years and see that, uh, because they just don't capture some of these dynamics in our community that the people that live here, we know that that's part of our community, but when someone runs a model, uh, it doesn't capture these types of quirks about the Tri-Cities. Uh, and so I would really like us to see, as a school board and a district, support a much more aggressive uh, facilities planning so that we're not constantly behind uh, on our numbers and our on our enrollment. I kind of got to chuckle about the the proposal including some to relieve overcrowding and improve safety because that's absolutely a fact in our community. And so until we take care of that, we're going to have issues for a long time. <clears throat> it is interesting that this year our. I think Pasco, or not Pasco, but Kennewick and Richland both increased in enrollment numbers more than we did. And so while we continue to grow, some of these other communities are growing even faster, but, I, but it's, uh, we definitely have very affordable homes here, and I think that's going to continue to bring in the young families that have kids. And I think on our agenda tonight, we're going we're gonna to talk more about our facilities planning, so that will be... That'll be an interesting segment. And I think our fabulous new culture, our new way of going about things, and, and the environment that is changing in Pasco is going to bring, is going to increase scores, and it's going to make our, our schools are going to be better, and I think that, too, will in turn bring in more kids. It will be interesting to see what happens when we lose some of the Hanford money, because that will, you know, at some point, that will go go down, and um, and I think that will affect Tri Cities economy. Um, and farming has started to take a downhill, and that could affect it. So there's there's things that could affect the growth of Tri Cities and slow it down a little bit. But we also see, you know, an, a lot of growth right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you for joining us this evening, and for those of you who stick around, we'll see you for our regular board meeting at 6.30.